I'll come up with some. You guys, we're alive. <laughs> Okay, who's who is ready, John? Greg. Is that Greg on this on the screen? Somewhere out there, or what? All right. I'll order this uh, Ottawa <laughs> County Board of Commissioners. That the date is uh, Tuesday, October thirteenth. Our uh, invocation today is by Commissioner Meplink, and the Pledge of Allegiance is led by Justin Roebuck. Please rise. Join me, please. Heavenly Father, we come before you this afternoon hour, Lord, and we thank you for bringing us all safely here for this meeting. We ask for your presence and your guidance as we discuss uh, issues that affect uh, Ottawa County and Ottawa County residents. We pray especially, Lord, for all of the Ottawa County employees and staff. Pray for our Sheriff's Department and our deputies, as well as they uh, protect us and keep us safe. And we just pray for safety for them and comfort for their loved ones at home while we get to uh, borrow their person uh, to protect us. Father, we pray that you'll be with uh, the men and women protecting our nation in the armed services. And we ask, Lord, that you will bless them, that you will keep their families safe at home so they have no worries. Father, be with our leaders of our nation, those in government around our country, and we just pray for wisdom for all. Father, we pray for all those that have been stricken with this pandemic. We ask, Lord, that you rid this from our nation and that uh, this disease or this virus can be gone away. Forgive us for the sins we have committed. God, guide and protect us in your name alone, we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would you pull pull the roll, please? Yes, sir. Call the roll, please. Mr. Garcia. Here. Mr. Bow. Here. Mr. Zylstra. Here. Mr. Dannenberg. Here. Mr. Meppelink. Here. Mr. Terpstra. Here. Mr. Holtfloor. Present. Mr. D. Young. Here. Mr. Kyers. Here. Mr. Bergman. Here. And Mr. Fenske. Here. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Next thing is presentation of petitions and communications. Are there any? None, none from us. Okay. The next thing on the agenda is public comment. This is an opportunity for anyone in the audience here or on Zoom to address the commission. We ask that you give us your name and address and that you limit your time to three minutes. Is there anyone in the public here that would like to speak to the commission at this time? Is not, if not, is there anyone on Zoom? No, sir, not this time. Okay, all right. Then the next thing is communication from county staff. And the first is uh, Director of Emergency Management, introduction by the Sheriff. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, as you're aware, uh, several months ago, Nick Bonstell had uh, left the Sheriff's Office. He was Director of Emergency Management and went into the private sector. Uh, Nick was with us for about two and a half years. and. Uh, we began that search for a new emergency management director and uh, we did not have to go too far. So I cannot go to Kent County anymore because we stole one from Kent County. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> the uh, search began and uh, I think we have found absolutely the perfect fit uh, that has us kind of slide right into the position, uh, boots on the ground. Uh, he's off and running, doing very well. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, Lou Hunt, and Lou will give you a little bit of a background of himself. But, uh, please welcome Lou to the uh, Sheriff's Office under the Emergency Management. Lou. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Chair and Vice Chair and Commissioners, I appreciate you all having me here uh, this afternoon. I can tell you that I'm really happy to be here in Ottawa. And as probably one of the newest people here at Ottawa, this is my moment to tell you something that's really cool, and I think you'd all appreciate it. Um, everybody has been so welcoming 
to me coming here. And it's been very, very obvious to me right out of the gate that there's a, a tremendous amount of teamwork here in Ottawa County. And I was brought right into that quickly. And I, I came from a good culture in Kent and I was very blessed to have been there for 26 years, but there's something special here. And um, it's obvious to me coming in. So I think that's testament to all of you and the culture that you've established here at Ottawa. It's pretty obvious to me. So very happy to be here. Um, I've got uh, a lot of education that's appropriate for emergency management. I got a bachelor's degree from Michigan State uh, in forensic science. I've got a master's degree in administration from Central Michigan University. I was fortunate to go through the Leadership Development Institute at Aquinas uh, College. Uh, I was uh, with the Sheriff's Office for 26 years, so the vast majority of that I was in charge of the crime scene unit, so I did investigations and uh, a lot of those were the roughest, as you can imagine, but um, many of them were just organizing very large investigations on the forensic end. Uh, during that time, uh, I was part of the mass fatality resource for the state of Michigan, uh, which is called MyMort and DART, the Disaster Assistance Recovery Team. And uh, I was the vice president of DART, and, which was really field operations for things like plane crashes and stuff like that. And then also uh, part of my mort, which is Michigan mortuary. So again, think mass fatality. Uh, in 2012, I got my PEM. That's the professional emergency manager from the state of Michigan. Uh, a lot of curriculum for that, a lot of classes to take and things, and it's regimented. Um, many years wanted to be a part of emergency management at Kent County, but it was locked up for a long time. We had an individual there that was there a long time. Uh, fortunately, towards the end of my career, the opportunity came up and I jumped at it. There was no question about it. It was where I wanted to be. And I uh, did that for two years at Kent County. As you know, uh, the last two years were quite a wild ride um, with COVID and civil unrest and um, you know, the, the largest uh, power outage in Kent County history, the way I understand it, in the polar vortex. Uh, that was my fifth week as emergency manager there had the seventh highest flooding in Kent County history, and it was just kind of on and on. And I think that's been your experience here for the last two years as well. And I'd love to say I'm gonna bring better luck to Ottawa County. I don't know if that's true, everybody. I hope it is, but um, so uh, after those two years, you know, I knew Nick Bond still real well. And I'm probably one of the only people that would, that would think to try and fill those shoes because he was a real stand-up guy and uh, he did a great job in emergency management and he was very in influential with me. So he was the first person that uh, reached out to me when I became an emergency manager and had a lot of influence. I'd call him on a regular basis and say, hey, what are you, what are you doing about this, Nick? And what do you think about that? And that was common for the two of us. So I'm not saying I'm Nick, but I'm, you know, I'm Lou, but uh, I definitely have a lot of influence from Nick over the years. And, so when Ottawa came up, there was no question. It was the, the county that I would go to after Kent. Um, it is the only county that I would go to after Kent because I knew so much about it through Nick and through others. I knew that uh, emergency management in Ottawa County was very well supported uh, by everybody, by, by the sheriff's office, by the administrator's office, by all of you. That was very, very obvious. Uh, I knew the people in emergency management in Ottawa County and I can tell you those are professional folks. I'm very fortunate to be part of that team. And for me personally, I, I still want a mission. I still want to be part of a team. I still uh, very much enjoy this and I really, really want to be here. So that's, that's really why I'm here. We obviously have a lot of things to tackle. COVID is, is very clearly one. And then we've got shoreline erosion. We've got impeding flooding. That's kind of an always situation or, or always in the uh, in the future anyway. A lot of different things. I'm getting my feet wet on a lot of them. Some are very similar to Kent uh, that we have, but some, for example, shoreline erosion, that's one that I'm coming up to speed with uh, and intend to work on that as well. So that's kind of who I am and uh, very much looking forward to working for all of you here in emergency management. I think all of the pieces are together here in Ottawa County for excellence. I think that's really the only goal uh, in emergency management, and I think that's exactly what we'll do. Any questions for Lou? 
I was just going to congratulate Lou once again on moving from Michigan's second best county to Michigan's <laughs> best. <laughs> <laughs> a great relationship with our county administrator, Wayman Britt, over at Kent County, and he told me that he would say that. And <laughs> Exactly what he said a couple of times. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. The next thing is uh, we're going to hear from Lisa Stefanowski, our uh, public health uh, update for the day. I believe she's on. I see she just took her mask off. And right. I think she should replace our, uh, our Greg guy. See you, Greg. <laughs> I think, uh, Mr. Chair, we're, we're having a, a little bit of an audio issue. So we're okay. going to try, uh, Lisa, I don't know if you can hear me, but we're going to try to move the mic down. We're not getting audio feed from Zoom in the main speakers. We're going to try our best. Okay. Can All you? right. Well, just tell me if I need to speak up louder. No, that's good. A little, little louder, Al was saying. Oh, okay. okay. Good. good. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you all for having me again to share um, just a, a short, brief status report on what is happening in the COVID-19 space. Um, as you can imagine, the last couple of weeks have been quite challenging, uh, mainly because of the changes regarding the uh, Michigan Supreme Court decision. Um, but we were working very closely with our state partners on quickly putting in other provisions in place to protect not only Michigan citizens, but the citizens of Ottawa County. Um, we've received many, many calls of inquiry about um, what it means, and we've been doing the best we possibly can to handle those calls and answer um, those questions um, to help people to um, maintain compliance as well as uh, safety. Um, I wanna to mention too that we continue to see um, pretty high numbers of cases coming in. And um, Darrell, in a moment, he's sitting behind me, is going to speak and provide um, a much more accurate data description than I will. So I'll turn it over to him in a second. But I do want to say that, you know, we've had days or weeks where we've had uh, 300 cases come in a week, uh, up to 500 cases a week when we were um, really in the thick of um, the Grand Valley outbreak. Um, and that becomes a significant challenge on our organization. Um, we have, since that time, been working closely with IT and our team here of experts to develop a new process for doing case investigation. And our goal is that we will be able to um, do case investigation for 60% of our cases using a technology um, tool. And what that will look like is if a person is a case, they will receive a text message um, that test text message will ask them a couple questions just to confirm that they are who um, we're intending the text message to go to. And from there, they will be taken to a survey, which will ask them a series of questions. Um, all of this data is uh, held in the greatest confidence. It's not shared with anybody. It only comes to us, and we use this data to um, help with uh, the um, investigation of contacts, we also are required by the state of Michigan to provide some data to them. And this data is just used for surveillance purposes so that we can look at and accurately identify trends and um, different things that will help us to mitigate the spread of COVID in our community and throughout Michigan. Um, we, we will, um, after collecting the information, um, we will put them in another technology queue, which will send daily monitoring text messages to them um, with opportunities for them to reach out to us or us to reach out to them in the event that people really need to have a phone call or a, you know, um, a personal chat other than just through uh, technology. Um, we've been using the daily monitoring text for quite some time for, for months, I would say, and it's been going very well. We've gotten a lot of very positive feedback from people. Um, we are limiting this new technology for case investigation to individuals under the age of 17 or, and um, I'm sorry, individuals under the age of 17 will not be able to use this technology, nor are individuals over the age of 70 at this point. Um, the reason that we did it that way was we really wanna make sure that um, we're able to give people tools and resources that they can really use. 
and we're not sure, you know, how comfortable people over the age of 70 are. Some people are very comfortable, others may not be. Um, and then obviously children may not be able to have access to technology either. So um, we're about two weeks into the use of that technology. Um, we've been calling, in, calling the first two weeks a pilot. Um, it's been going well. Um, I don't want to um, give the impression that we've perfected it yet though. We still have some bugs to work out and we received calls from our community saying that there were a few glitches and we've um, quickly been trying to fix those glitches. Um, but overwhelmingly the positive, the response has been positive. And um, we've had days where we've had an 80% response rate to these um, case investigation messages, which, um, you know, when you have a week where you have 600 cases come in and you can get an 80% response rate, it's really, really a blessing for us. So um, I'll just ask if you have any questions about that. And if you do, I'd have, be happy to take those now and then I'll turn it over to Darrell. All right, thank you. Uh, Lisa, oh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Meplank, question for you. How, how, does, how does one know that text, if I receive one, how do you, how can you legitimize that I know it's not a spam text? Is there, how can we tell people that that text they're receiving is to make it more assured that they're receiving something legitimate? Okay. Um, I'm gonna bring Jarrell up here too. He might be able to answer this better than I am um, with his text skills, but we, um, are, we are sending an initial text before the actual survey text is my understanding. Do you wanna answer that? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that question. Um, we try to use technology to our advantage. So here at Ottawa County, we've doubled down on technology. So, um, we're using a tool that we yeah, send a text to our cases. Um, and that's a good question. Uh, we live in a time now when a lot of us are receiving texts for lots and lots of different reasons. And so how do you determine what's you know, spam and what's worth listening to? And um, what we try to do is we try to tailor the language to let people know that this is coming from the Ottawa County Department of Public Health. The other thing that we have to our advantage is typically if you've been tested for COVID-19, which involves a swab going up your nose, um, you're usually um, aware that you are under are being tested. And um, if you're getting a text from the health department um, at the same time or near the same time that you've been tested, hopefully that's some sort of cue um, to answer. And we want to use platforms like this to let people to know that if you've tested positive for COVID-19, that it's um, very possible that you could be getting a text from us. And so to summarize, you probably have been tested and uh, we'll hopefully be looking for a text from the health department. And two, we're trying to use language that makes it clear that it is from the Ottawa County Department of Public Health. Mm -hmm. And it's branded. So it has um, our, our logo and colors on it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Frank. Lisa, I do have a question. Uh, I know that there are still folks out there who are against wearing masks and so forth, and that they can ask for a medical exemption. Is there a standard form or a standard process that someone would be able to uh, receive something like that? Um, yeah, in the school system, um, we're very, I would say, strict about that. Um, we require a medical exemption in there. We have a whole criteria for what a medical exemption is and looks like. Um, there is a specific form. Um, the medical exemption has to be provided by a licensed medical doctor. Um, outside of the K-12 community, there are not real strict guidelines, I'll be honest with you. Um, it really is in, in large part left up to an employer, um, you know, to create rules around, you know, what they will accept and what they won't. The recommendation though is that a medical exemption is provided by a licensed medical provider. Um, we do know from our licensed medical providers that very, very few conditions actually prevent or would prevent somebody from qualifying to wear a surgical mask, such as the one that I'm wearing today. Good. Well, well, so there is no standard card or anything like that that the state or the county or anyone is able to issue at this point? No, there is not. Now I can tell you
We lost video. We, we lost, lost, audio. lost audio. Lost your audio, Lisa. Sorry. I'm able to read lips either. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can read your lips right now? Yeah. <laughs> Where'd you go first? <clears throat> It's okay. It sounded like there. the answer was no either way. Okay, thank you. <laughs> she can't hear us either? Huh. <laughs> Can you hear us, Lisa? <laughs> Apparently not. I don't think she can hear us either. One of the things I can do is I see you. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't help. Okay, on our end. I don't you know. can text her and just tell her I withdraw my question. <laughs> That's an issue they're having on their end, but I'm not sure. Why don't you, um, Justin or Sherry, send them a text and just ask them if we can. If we've got more questions, we can uh, come back on. We'll just sure. text her. Can, can you hear us now? Oh, yes. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, yep. good, good. We don't know what happened, but um, Jarrell, I'll, I'll let him take over and we'll okay. let you move on from there. Okay. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, my name is Darrell Grasshauer. I'm the senior epidemiologist with Ottawa County. I am so pleased to be with you all this afternoon. Um, with move someone over there. A little, would you move a little closer to your... Uh, Please. Microphone, please. You bet. Can you hear me now? Yeah. That's much better. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Drew Glassar. I'm the senior epidemiologist here at Ottawa County. I'm pleased to be with you all here today, and I'm just going to share a brief update on COVID-19 epidemiology here in Ottawa County, uh, just to give us a, a snapshot of the here and the now. Um, I'd like to share my screen. So I'm going to try right now. Um, would someone at Fillmore give me permission to share my screen? <laughs> He's working there right now. Okay. <laughs> okay, you should you should be good, Jarrell. Perfect. All right, can you see a PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. Got it. Awesome. <clears throat> Lisa, can you help me out one second just to figure out how to get Nope, we're good. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Okay, this is going to be a brief update on COVID-19 epidemiology. Um, the first thing I want to point out is just trends that we've seen over the course of the outbreak. Um, and a lot has changed and a lot has happened over the last six or seven months. And so we <laughs> tend to forget the things that happen just because we're on to the next challenge. But through the course of the outbreak, there have been basically four themes uh, to the work that we've been doing. So initially in the outbreak, we saw a lot of cases in long-term care facilities. So uh, older folks were being tested at a higher rate and we were detecting cases there. We saw a lot of deaths in the beginning of the outbreak, uh, often attributed just to outbreaks and spread in long-term care facilities. And then we saw cases in food processing and manufacturing. You probably remember the, the national media around uh, food shortages and outbreaks at um, large meat processing plants. And then we had a little bit of a tail off, and this isn't just for Ottawa County. Some of these same themes were seen across the nation. And then in the summer, you probably remember Dr. Fauci talking about um, teens and people in their early 20s, just encouraging them to continue to be socially distanced. And then a couple of key local events, like a large outbreak at a bar in um, around Michigan State University that resulted in some statewide media as well as national media. So we saw some of the same trends here in Ottawa County with more cases in um, young folks across the summer months. And then once school started after about September 1, we saw a dramatic run up of cases. Most of them, or many of them, associated with Grand Valley State University to the tune of hundreds of cases. So this was a big change for us here in Ottawa County. Um, thankfully, uh, the number of Grand Valley cases has decreased. And we've moved into this new phase of the outbreak where after Grand Valley cases subsided, we were still left with as many or more cases than we saw on our previous highs. So you can see through October here, many days we're seeing somewhere between 30 and 45 cases, which would have been kind of monthly highs uh, through the summer. So our new baseline is our old high level. And what we're seeing right now is that there's not one consistent theme with the cases that we're seeing. So all the previous waves had 
uh, one kind of thing that we could target, a way that we could use our resources and really have an impact. And right now what we're seeing is a rise across the entire county. So the next slide I wanna show is just how this uh, overlaps with Grand Valley. You can see this is the, kind of the same slide with these waves through time. And then the Grand Valley cases are in light blue here and you can see that they've decreased dramatically through late September and early October and community-wide cases have continued to increase. So all of these recent purple cases, these new highs, we can't really pinpoint to one particular entity like we could with Grand Valley in early September. So Grand Valley is not driving the current increase or sustained elevated number of cases that we're seeing. When we dive into the data a little bit and break things down by age, this top figure shows um, age decades zero to nine, 10 to 19 and 20 to 29. You can see that there's this big bump for the Grand Valley cases, but also a little blip that we're seeing here in the zero to nine. And it's hard to see because of the scale. But in one week, we went from about two cases a week to 13 cases. And so we're seeing an increase even in this younger population of zero to nine. And then if you look at the other age groups, the decades between 30 and 80, um, it looks like things have gone down, but that's simply because this week, the week we're in is not over yet. Overall, you can see that there's an increase in 80 plus, 70 to 79, and so forth. Every single one of these age groups, we're seeing an increase, almost a rising tide in the community, lifting all the demographics with it. And if we look at our region, zooming out from Ottawa County to the Grand Rapids region, uh, which is how the state breaks out the, the risk when they're doing risk analysis, they break this data out into different categories. We are in the Grand Rapids area we're in the risk level D. So if you're looking at the Grand Rapids region, the risk level D is the second to the highest level. And each of these levels is determined by different um, epidemiological factors like rates or positivity. And I have another slide to show some more information on that. But if we're just talking about the Grand Rapids region, our risk level is D. And over this weekend, Ottawa County actually had a three-day surge alert on Sunday indicating that our case counts had increased 10% every day for three days straight, indicating that we were just seeing more and more cases. The issue with all of this is that with more and more cases and higher and higher positivity, our risk level will go up, which may impact our ability to do things like conduct in-person um, learning and education in our community. And schools are an institution. They're a very important part of our social fabric and important for the education of our kids. And so obviously uh, increases in cases impact our schools. So when we're looking at our region, the Grand Rapids region right now, this is as of this morning, test positivity is at 3.9%. New cases are at 104.4, so hovering somewhere in here. This level, 150 cases per million per day, is the threshold for level E, which is the highest risk level. Um, and you can see that we've had what looks like a decrease in the number of cases, but this might be a lag. We have seen a two-week general increase in the proportion of positive tests. Uh, all this to say that our risk level is increasing and we are approaching thresholds um, that could push us in a new risk level. Our neighbors uh, and counties around us are also seeing this increase which contributes to this overall trend. So although new cases are trending down, at least in the very short term regionally, Ottawa and our neighbors have seen unprecedented numbers and Ottawa has not had 78 cases uh, a day over this weekend, which is <coughs> all time high. So zooming out even further, just talking about how we can prevent increases in cases and prevent spread in our communities. I wanted to point out an example from Arizona. The CDC has um, a, a journal that they put out called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. It's basically short reports on what's going on in the public health world uh, to give us an idea of how we can respond better as a community. It's a great place to share the things we've learned about COVID-19. I wanted to point out uh, three things. One, Arizona has seen and been through some really uh, a tough period of time with a dramatic increase in cases and then a decrease in the early summer. When um, cases start started to increase, and this is the second thing, stay-at-home orders had been lifted and closures had expired. And shortly thereafter, cases started to increase substantially. And as things were about to peak, local officials, uh, Arizona is a home rule state, meaning that their counties or regions can make decisions locally for public health policy. 
local officials um, mandated mask wearing and then initiated other um, prevention mechanisms throughout the outbreak. And the takeaway here is that these things work. So when they initiated these actions like mask mandates and social distancing and closures or reductions in density in particular areas, um, you saw case counts going down and almost to the point that they were at the baseline prior to uh, this wave. And so if we're thinking about zooming back into Ottawa County and seeing our own increase in cases, we're seeing sustained increase. We don't have a particular theme. And so it's just really, really important to remember that masking, socially distancing, and washing our hands are all effective ways to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And if we don't have a particular population to target for our intervention strategies, that it's a good strategy for all of us to remember that each one of us can have an impact by doing these things. And our decisions about masking and social distancing affect all of us. Um, there are at least three institutions or entities, schools, courts, and long-term care facilities that have specific um, guidance tied to some of the metrics I talked about before, like cases per day per million and positivity. And if we start to slide on those metrics, um, there may, may be different um, actions that need to be taken in schools and among our court system and in our long-term care facilities. And these things all impact our economy and businesses. So my appeal here today is you know, please remember that our whole community can do something together um, to prevent COVID-19 and hopefully bring case counts down in Ottawa County, in our region, in our state. And if there's three things to remember, it's mask, distance, and wash our hands. And I hope that we can all work together to share that message. And that's it for me. I'm gonna turn to Lisa. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Anybody have questions? I got one question. Um, the percentage was 3.9, and that's for this last week? Or is that, it says 3.9, and what's, What's the time frame? And that's for the Grand Rapids regional area, right? Correct, the Grand Rapids regional area. I'm sorry, Commissioner, I don't have the exact timeline. Um, it's usually a, a short period um, ahead of when they publish the numbers. So I don't know if it's daily or if it's uh, over a course of a few days. So I can get that information and get it to you uh, if you'd like. Okay, and there is a certain number of that percentage that you'd like to be at, am I correct? Correct. There's a number of different metrics. Lower is always better. Yeah. Um, so you'll, you'll see some recommendations for 10, like some for five, but frankly, anything, anything we're, low. Where are we at? Where are we at two something earlier this, uh, this fall? Yes, there have been times here in Ottawa County in particular where we've been, you know, as less than 2%. Uh, so seeing it tick up to close to 4% is, um, <coughs> That we have opportunity for improvement, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Joe. Uh, Commissioner Bauman here. Um, quick question. Do you keep statistics as to the positives? Um, which ones of the positives are systematic and asystematic? I mean, how mm -hmm. many, do we know how many people that test positive that never develop symptoms? That's a really good question. Um, we actually see more asymptomatic cases when people need to be tested for things like medical procedures. So standard precautions that a clinic or a hospital may take before you go in for um, an elective procedure. And so we do pick up uh, a fair proportion of asymptomatic cases. I don't have the numbers in front of you, but what I can say is at, at the very least, I have seen at least 15% of our cases uh, have been reported as asymptomatic cases. And do any of those cases actually develop into COVID with symptoms? There are times when we interview our cases and collect most of the information at one point in time. And it is entirely possible that we have detected someone in an early phase where they're shedding virus but not yet symptomatic. And we may not catch up with them and change them to symptomatic. So it is very possible that some of our cases that we identify as asymptomatic initially develop symptoms later, but I don't have a specific number for you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Al Danenberg, Commissioner. So if 15% of the 
citizens of Ottawa County could be, uh, like you said, spreading the virus and they're not feeling sick, they feel wonderful. Is that correct? There's a, yes, there's a good chance that if you're asymptomatic, you're, you're feeling fine. And I think you're, what you're driving at is they're continuing their usual daily activities. Yes, you're usually feeling well enough to go about your usual life. And you could be spreading the virus. Right now. Frank? Yes. Yes, I have a question. Um, in terms of the increase of numbers, are you able to trace what percentage of those folks are uh, among household or family members? That's an, a really good question and one I should have brought up. When we look at the data, so instead of counting, but just generally anecdotally get an idea of the theme, one of the themes that we're seeing is lots of households. Um, and so cases that would span multiple generations. So we're seeing a little bit more in um, grade school age children and then their parents. So we do see a fair number of households that develop cases and end up contributing to the overall increase because of transmission in a household setting. And that's where things are typically a lot higher risk just because of the force of exposure. So more time spent together and around someone who may be coughing up particles that aren't being swept away by an air exchange or wind or something like that. So is it the county's process then or the health department's process that if a family member or two uh, have uh, contracted the COVID that you would test the whole families that they've been in contact with then? If someone in a family does not have symptoms, we consider them a close contact and monitor them for uh, quite a while. If they develop symptoms, we make the recommendation that, that they go in and get tested. And we've been working hard in our community to make sure that there is uh, ample uh, access to testing and um, ease of testing. So there may be still some small barriers, but overall in our community, we've seen um, access to testing increase dramatically. So in a, in a household, uh, asymptomatic family member, we will work hard to uh, ensure that they have an opportunity to be tested. Well, I guess that that was my, uh, yeah, my point is that if someone is not being tested, even though but they are in contact with a family member who does and that they're asymptomatic, that it's possible that they're still going about their daily routine of going to work or going to school. So until they show symptoms, uh, it's when they would get tested then? I understand. So a family member who's asymptomatic is in quarantine. Um, as a contact to a case that's been identified through investigation, public health would issue a notice to that person um, that they need to be remaining at home and away from other people and um, stop doing many of their usual activities, in some cases even going to work or school, uh, because they may be shedding the virus before they know it. So we don't want people out in the community, kind of like the whole point of this conversation is, you know, what can we do to prevent the spread? That's one way to do it. If you're a family member, you're considered a close contact and you're kept in quarantine to prevent further spread outside of the household. Okay, thank you. So in other words, a whole family is quarantined. Right. Often, yes. Yeah. I just wanna add one thing too. Um, you're bringing up really great questions and um, I think you're putting a light on how important quarantine and isolation are. Um, this is a tricky virus. It doesn't always act the same in every situation. And, you know, we're talking about the asymptomatic person. Well, there also can be situations, and we just had this in, in our own public health um, family here with one of our employees where um, the person, our employee was a household contact and actually started showing symptoms and had a test and the test was negative. And then two days later had another test and that test was negative, still showing symptoms. On the third test, um, still showing symptoms and the third test finally came back positive. So they weren't showing enough of this viral load, right? To detect the virus in this individual system. So, you know, the, the quarantine is so, so, so important with or without symptoms. If you're a household contact or you're a close contact at work or um, in your friendships, it's just so important to stay in quarantine. And quarantine can sometimes be confusing to people. Quarantine, for some people, they think it means I just can't go to work, but I can go to my kids, you know, soccer game. And that's just not the case. It's quarantine means you have to stay away 
from people for a period of 14 days. That's work, that's play, that's even in your family, if you want to protect your family members from um, exposure, um, you should stay quarantined from them. Lisa, I, I'm not sure that the public fully understands that point right. you just made. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's a way that um, you can get that message out through press and maybe even through, um, you know, some of the TV stations, uh, any, any, any way that you might be able to get that message out. Because I, I think people assume that if one family member has it and they don't have it, they can still, you know, do whatever. And I, I think it's important for everyone to realize the importance of quarantine. Yeah. I, I, Christian Bergman, I cannot agree more. Um, we're really working hard on putting out news releases and public information, um, information for our partners. Um, we're, I know Jarrell is gonna do the same presentation that he just did to you for our Chamber of Commerce, so that'll go out to a number of businesses. Um, we'll continue to emphasize it. Um, I also encourage you to share this information with your networks. It's very, very important. And the more we can clarify and educate our community on um, how the virus spreads, uh, the better off we'll be. So thank you. Anyone else? I have one. Yes. I have a relation who was in quarantine and his wife is now in quarantine with him. They just took their mother-in-law out of a nursing home to go for a color tour. <laughs> oh my God. Who can you report this to? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, this is totally flagrant. And the nursing home is a large nursing home. And if she gets it. Um, if you would like to call me after the meeting, I'd be happy to take that information and we can reach out to the um, long-term care facility or yeah. um, residents, wherever she's staying, and we can notify them. And I appreciate you bringing that forward because that would be a, a very, very significant risk to the other individuals in that facility. I will call you. Thank you. Okay. Any, anyone else? Thank you, Lisa, Terrell. Thank you. Thank you. Next thing on our agenda is approval of agenda. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Moved and supported. Comments or questions? <coughs> Justin, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Floor? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Under action and report, consent as a resolution, Mr. Fenske. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to accept consent resolutions one and two. I moved and supported. Comments or questions? Justin, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Meppel? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Holfloor? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Danenberg? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Under action items from administration, um, Mr. Kyers, would you mind taking those two items? Uh, let me go back here, Roger. Got ahead of you here. Yeah, I can do that. Oh, Joe's got in my hand for me. Thank you, Joe. Um, the Ottawa County Strategic um, Business Plan, the motion is to approve the Ottawa County Strategic 2020-2021 Business Plan. Board. Moved and supported. Comments or questions? Mr. Robick. Would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Meppelink? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. The Family Justice Center Project IPD agreement, and the motion is to approve the integrated project delivery agreement among TLZ, Michigan, Granger Construction Company in Ottawa County. Second. Second. Um, yes, Mr. Sure. Vanderberg, uh, would you explain this, please? Yes, this has uh, been a long time coming. You last took this up in, I think, November of, of uh, 2000, 
uh, 19, and we've been at the drawing board, uh, both learning uh, from the attorney that you approved us to use, the IPD specialist that's done these around the country, including in Michigan. And we're talking about integrated project delivery. It's a different method of doing construction, uh, different than the way buildings have typically been built for the past 100 plus years. Uh, this is a method we learned about initially from Rex Miller, who's the kind of international author and consultant that got his start at uh, Hayworth and spoke at our Innovation and Technology Forum a few years ago. Uh, he's written a book that highlights this and we, we read that and decided with this project coming up that we wanted to undertake this type of project. And the more we peeled the onion, the more we learned that even though there are projects in Michigan as close as Kent County that have been called IPDs, uh, there have been some significant differences between those projects and what we would think of as a uh, full IPD. Uh, for example, typically the, uh, I, the projects that have been called IPDs have put 7% of profit at risk in the agreement. Uh, and as, as we've negotiated the past 10 months, 100% of the risk is in the risk pool. Uh, and also I think that uh, we've got a pretty good, a, a very good appreciation for how the process works. One of the big differences is typically when you do a project, you hire an architect, they design something, you bring on a CM, and then the CM brings on the subs, and then everybody meets and smiles at the ribbon cutting, ground breaking, and then it's kind of a fist fight to the end of the project, and typically you're fighting over change orders and you get a lot of extra cost on the back end of the project. And in some cases, in most cases, I would say, a little bit inferior design than what you get through the IPD. With the IPD, the partners come together at the beginning and design the building together. So you get that expertise working in conjunction with one another. And there's a huge incentive to collaborate and to do it right from the beginning because you've got 100% of the profit at risk. Uh, and so uh, we're excited to get moving on this. Uh, with this action, you're not approving a project cost that will come back to you. So at this point, it's more like you're approving a template and a contract so that the project can be designed. And once it's designed and the costs are known, then it would come back to the Board of Commissioners for a vote. And then once the Board of Commissioners votes and approves that project in that upper limit of the budget, then it would be basically transferred to the ownership of the Ottawa County Building Authority. And uh, the Building Authority would then own the project and, and ultimately own the building until such time as uh, the debt that would be sold to fund this project is paid off. And that's how we've done other projects. Uh, I think just in my tenure, we've done about $55 million of building projects, including uh, the jail expansion, the Hudsonville, uh, doubling the Hudsonville Court uh, and Human Services Building, uh, the, the new district court in Holland, the Ottawa County Courthouse in Grand Haven, the remodel of the Ottawa County Human Services Building in Grand Haven and the addition to Fillmore, the 35,000 square feet we added here. So we've done a lot of projects uh, over the years and uh, we think this is the way projects will be done in the future, both in terms of uh, getting better quality, better space utilization, and also ultimately uh, better, better uh, money spent. So uh, efficiency savings and dollars spent as, as well. All right, thank you. Comments or questions? Mr. Chair, um, there's no dollar amount attached to this action right here. That's correct. Just the only expenditures we've had so far is with Hanson and Bridget, right? Uh, yes, uh, we've had Hanson and Bridget and also Mabel Casey. We hired her early on. Okay. She has a $50,000 contract. She helped determine the space needs with all the parties that are stakeholders in the building. And I think 40,000 of that 50 has been expended. Okay, and then Hanson Bridget, how far are we along with that contract? We, uh, they, we fully met the 40,000 that the county hired and then the building authority extended that okay. uh, to a maximum through the project, all the way through the project of 120. So right now we're about 70,000 in uh, Right now about, about roughly. 60, 60, yeah, right. somewhere in that area and we're about to start the auditing. Okay, anyone else? Justin, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Holvlor? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes.
Motion passes. Next thing is we have uh, no appointments and discussion items, Ottawa County District, Megan Booz. Hi, good afternoon. So I'm Megan Bowes. I'm the executive director with the Ottawa Conservation District. And I am here today to first to thank you for your support for our district and the investment you've made with us. I'd like to demonstrate to you today um, how the support has gone into managing our natural resources here in Ottawa County. And I'd also like to highlight how we're paralleling our environmental and ag goals with those laid out in your counter strategic plan. Um, I've broken our programs into several categories to keep things short and sweet. Um, our district has grown immensely in the last five years, and I'm excited to brag about our achievements and our staff um, a little bit to you today. Um, let's start with ag. As you know, the ag industry here in Ottawa County is diverse and robust. We value our producers here in the county, and we've done our best to offer conservation and natural resource assistance. We do this in several ways. The first way is through our MEEP program. MEEP stands for Michigan Agriculture Environmental Assistance Program. As you know, um, this program supports agriculture producers as they, protect to protect, as they work to protect our natural resources. MEEP is a voluntary, proactive program that assists pro producers in assisting, assessing their operations and making environmental and economic sustainable management decisions. It provides producers with technical and confidential advice to reduce the risk of groundwater contamination. MEEP is for all sizes of farms, small and large, and for all commodities. It includes greenhouses, fruit, and forestry operations. MEEP offers verifications in four different systems, cropping, livestock, farmstead, and forest and wetland habitat. To become verified, a producer works with our MEEP specialist, Sarah Bronkema, to go through this program. Last year, we completed 18 verifications, 39 risk assessments, and 72 risk reductions. We'd, all, we'd also been able to provide cost share for fuel pads, secondary containment, and water tests. This um, program is primarily funded through the Michigan Department of Rural Development. not following my PowerPoint very well. <laughs> the second program that we focus on, there we go, that also focuses on the ag community as well as residential owners is our Bass River Restoration Project. This project is, um, has been developed and put in place to um, address water quality into specific watersheds here in our county. The primary goal of this uh, project is to reduce E. coli contamination in both bodies of water. To reach this goal, we are able to do two uh, primary things. We can inspect, repair, and replace failing septic systems, and we can offer best management practices to reduce water runoff um, on ag land to prevent uh, and to, uh, for water quality. This year, we've replaced five septic, six, five septic systems for a total of $23,844. And we've been able to put on 2,500 acres of cover crops and grassed waterways for a total of $97,351. This project is funded through the Environmental Great Lakes and Energy, or EGLE. As I mentioned prior, I wanted to also demonstrate how we align with your strategic plan. This com the conservation district understands the challenge that the county faces with our groundwater concerns, and we want to be part of that solution. This year, we're applying for a partnership grant through the Natural Resource Conservation Service. I brought our MEEP specialist, Sarah Bronkema, to, who has been the lead on this project, to tell you a little bit more about this application. Sarah? Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, last year, Paul Sachs approached the Ottawa Conservation District to see how we could assist in addressing the, the county's groundwater issues from an agricultural perspective. It is the intent of the Conservation District to apply for a grant funding from the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service to assist farmers in implementing conservation practices on their land. 
The project we are proposing includes practices such as cover crops, reduced tillage, irrigation management, and many others that are shown to have benefits to soil health and water quality and groundwater recharge. Research has shown that improving soil health and soil structure increases the water holding capacity of the soil. Essentially, during a precipitation event, these improved soils allow more water to infiltrate down rather than run off of our fields. Um, and this is beneficial in multiple ways. Um, it will hold water in place longer, which is important in those recharge areas where we want water to stay rather than run off into our ditches and lakes and streams. It will also increase the soil's ability to, to withstand a dry spell. For dryland crops, this means less crop loss due to drought. Um, and on irrigated ground, it will reduce our irrigation needs and water use. And in addition to the benefits to groundwater recharge and water use, the reduced water running off of these fields will mitigate erosion and nutrient loss, which is furthering the goal of protecting Ottawa County's water quality. Um, this project is the first step in the district's goal to address the county's groundwater issues, um, and we will continue to work with the county and additional partners to develop projects and methods to address this issue. We will pursue other funding sources to build a holistic solution and make the county's agricultural sector more resilient in the face of continued challenges, both local and global. Thank you. Okay. So switching from our ag focus to our SISMA, you're probably asking yourself, what is a SISMA? A SISMA is a Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. Um, these are nonprofit groups, government agencies, businesses, and volunteers that come together to tackle the issue of invasive species in the region. Michigan is made up of several SISMAs. Ours has been recognized as a leader in the state and is often a template for new and emerging programs. Through our CISMA, the Conservation District offers technical assistance, identification, and control of non-native invasive species through two ongoing projects. The first one is our Invasive Species Strike Team. This year, we have a, thir a three-person team. Um, typically, our team operates from May to October. We were put on a funding pause for a period of time, and so this team has only been working from July through October. Um, the team serves West Michigan community and provides information, identification, and eradication efforts for high threat invasive species. The goal of this work is to prioritize early detection to have a rapid response so we can prevent widespread establishment. Um, this program is funded through the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and the United States Forest Service. These grants, grants allow us to provide survey treatment and monitoring for um, several watch list species, such as things like Japanese knotweed or um, European frogbit, yellow floating, floating harp. There's many others. Um, also, with some of the budget cuts that we've seen, we've been um, we've asked our strike team, we now ask landowners to make a small investment and we get um, some suggested service costs when we work on landowners uh, invasives. The crew can also offer a, um, they can offer assistance with invasive species that are not covered by this grant and this service is um, paid in full by the landowner, but something we can offer our community. The second focus of our CISMA has been with our forest pest team. A few years ago, the district partnered with Ottawa County Parks to tackle a new and emerging threat, hemlock woolly adalgid. I'd like our SISMA coordinator, Drew Rayner, to tell you a little bit about how we became involved in this program and what it's about. Drew? Good afternoon. Um, like Megan said, my name is Drew and I'm the West Michigan SISMA coordinator. Um, here we cover a seven county area here in West Michigan trying to address invasive species on a holistic larger scale. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid is a small insect um, native to Japan. Uh, this attacks our eastern hemlock trees and if unaddressed will lead to tree mortality in seven to ten years. In Michigan we have roughly 150 million hemlock trees so it's a pretty significant resource here in the state. Um, if you're familiar with emerald ash borer, um, it's a little different than ash borer. Emerald ash borer came in and killed our trees before we really even knew we had it. It was very fast acting. Hemlock lily adelgid is a lot slower acting, so we have a real chance of having an impact with this species. Um, hemlock has been present in Michigan since 2006. Um, every time it's popped up, we've locally eradicated it throughout the state. Um, that was until 2015, uh, fall of 2015, when HWA was found here in West Michigan, kind of on a larger scale. 
during the year 2016, spent a lot of time um, realizing that it's pretty widespread in Ottawa and Muskegon counties. 2017, we applied for some grants. So we worked closely with Ottawa County Parks, applied for funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and the state of Michigan um, to start doing on the ground work and start managing this issue on public and private land. Um, in total, we've received over 1.5 million in funding to date um, to work on this. And we're serving as kind of the private land and local municipal land lead. Uh, the state of Michigan DNR um, and other agencies are working hard on their own state lands as well as addressing the forest service land um, while the Ottawa Conservation District is taking the lead on the remaining um, of the infestation. Um, our priority has been addressing this resource or this issue on a north to south focus. So um, most of our hummocks are in the UP, northern and lower. Uh, here in Ottawa County and in West Michigan, they kind of stick right to the coastline in our critical dune areas and other high quality habitats. We spend most of our time working on this grant project up in Mason and Northern Oceana counties at that leading front, front trying to work our way back south um, to protect the, the resources as a whole here in Michigan. Um, to date, we've treated a little over 45,000 trees since 2018. Um, this has been working with over 525 properties, over 2,000 acres, and have been working um, from Mason County to Allegan County. Uh, last year, we started offering the service at a four higher rate for this non-priority or for the non-priority areas, so not in the northern areas. So doing this work at cost for landowners and entities um, that have this issue that want to address it, that can't afford to go to the private sector, um, we want to still provide the service to them. Um, to date, we've treated over 15,000 trees. Most of them have been here in Ottawa and Allegan counties. Um, and are working with partners like Ottawa County Parks, providing them um, equipment and resources and knowledge on how to address this on their own properties. Um, we're gonna continue to work with the state and all the other various partners and, and work to address this issue on private land and hope to be here as a resource moving forward for private landowners here in the county and in West Michigan. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. So believe it or not, that's not all we do. Um, well, again, not on my slides. Oh. Okay, so we also have a forestry assistance program. Um, this is, focuses on educating uh, education and technical assistance for private landowners. Um, the purpose of this program is to aid conservation um, and their efforts for Michigan residents to better understand, protect, and utilize their forest resources. Our forester can offer a free initial professional contact with landowners who are interested in actively managing their forested um, land for recreation, wildlife, timber harvest, um, ecosystem preservation, et cetera. Um, this project is funded through MDART as well. We've also connect, uh, conducted this year two road stream crossing assessments, one in the Pigeon River watershed and one in the Sand Creek watershed. Um, the data from these road stream crossings go to the Road Commission and to the water resources, as well as it gets our boots on the ground so we can see some of the natural resource needs in those areas. This grant was funded by the Great Lakes Fisheries Trust. These, these assessments in the Pigeon River watershed helped lead, lead us to our partnership with Eagle and writing a Pigeon River watershed management plan, which we're currently doing. Within this water management plan, we're also able to um, look at the groundwater concerns and include this in that plan, leading us one step closer to becoming eligible for cost share funds in this watershed. This grant is also funded through EGLE. Not only do we prioritize the cost share grants, but we also prioritize um, engaging our community. So this year we hosted one scrap tire drop-off day collecting over 1900 tires. Um, and we did two highway cleanups as well as two beach cleanups. We'll also have one more scrap tire uh, cleanup day in the spring, as well as more highway cleanups and beach cleanups to come. On non-COVID years, we also offer a, nat a natural resource education to the community. We currently have two projects on hold, one education grant to assist teachers with natural resource education models within the Coopersville schools. And the second event is aimed at educating and assisting our ag, ag community through our Cultivating Resilience Field Day. Lastly, our fundraisers. We have three tree seedling fund, we have three fundraisers 
one tree seedling fundraiser and two native plant uh, fundraisers. These help us um, in a twofold effect. They help provide us with some additional um, support, operational support, as well as achieving some reforestation needs with residents here in our county. So what's next? We told you a little bit about the RCPP we're applying for, for the groundwater um, initiative. We're also looking for more 319 funding through EGLE to assist um, Crockery Lake and Sand Creek watersheds with septic system replacements and best management practices. Um, as well as after conducting those road stream crossings, we um, saw several culverts in need of replacement and we're hoping to seek funding to be able to do some replacements on those culverts. So we have a lot planned. Um, this is all thanks to the operational support that all of you have given us. We wouldn't have been able to expand and to write the grants we're doing and to continue the work um, here in our county without your uh, unwavering support. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you for letting me tell you a little bit about us. I gave you a lot in a really short period of time. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. I have two experts here too. So. Any questions Shoot. for Megan? I'd just like to make a comment. You know, I really appreciate the work you do. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can track the dollars we invest and the return we get is amazing. So I just want to make sure you guys understand that. So this is one of our best investments that we can, you know, make in, in the state, in the county of Ottawa. So, and I work with, with Ben, we'd be doing a lot of restoration in, uh, on, on the lands out in Victory Farms. So appreciate you working with us. So thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions? If not, thanks, Megan. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, report of the county administrator. You're up. Yes, uh, we've been busy uh, working on the Family Justice Center project. Uh, bargaining began today, so we have seven uh, labor groups that uh, have contracts up at the end of this year. And uh, so we have started with one group today. We have another one Friday. And uh, we'll probably be doing that uh, close right up to the end of the year with the goal of having all the new contracts in place uh, by January 1st. Uh, also, uh, Robin's been working hard on the DEI strategic plan and, and I think that'll be wrapped up here in the next uh, hopefully month or six weeks. Uh, and uh, just wanted to point out, I, I sent something out a couple weeks ago, uh, but it's V2 version two uh, of the the white paper that's done on the health plan. Uh, and just wanted to point out that uh, we did have our second year of 0% increases in, in premiums. The year before that was 1%. Uh, so we're just seeing outstanding, I think, performance on our health plan. Uh, and uh, just really credit uh, Marcy, HR staff, our partners at Gallagher and, and uh, just really working hard uh, with Priority Health to uh, keep those costs down. I think initially it was looking like the actuarial numbers were 11%. Uh, the initial proposal was three and, and the team was able to get it down to zero. So I think it was uh, just to really thank uh, our team a lot for that. Uh, just a lot of projects are underway or starting. If you glanced over at the jail, you might've seen people on the roof doing the next phase of jail roof replacement. Uh, we also have some teams about to start on uh, the next uh, new phases of our critical workers uh, with the Robinson brain health work. Uh, so there's just a lot going on right now. So thanks. That's it for today. Okay. Thank you. Next thing is general information comments or meetings attended. Anybody? How about how did uh, farms um, atop us go? Oh, it worked out really well. Um, right around $18,000 we were able to secure. Okay. In a safe environment, and uh, the online auction went really well. Chris, I'm glad I got it. <laughs> <laughs> in bid high enough. In bid high enough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Next thing. Public comment. If there's anyone in the audience who'd like to uh, address <clears throat> count, uh, commission at this time, or anyone online. We have no one online, Mr. Chair. All right, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I have one thing I want to make a comment. Uh, Zoom Record put out a um, puts out a paper once a week, and they got a historical page, and a big section of it was about the Ottawa County Commissioners back in 1970. Phil 
Al you tried to blame you. me. Not true. <laughs> We're the commissioner then yet? No. <laughs> Kyle wasn't even born yet. <laughs> so they wanted to put a, a dump. The road commission wanted to put a dump on, I think, Pigeon Creek. And they had a lot of pushback on that. And that was all written in here. I'm going to leave it here. If anybody wants to read it, they gladly can. So, all right. I'd like to make one comment. I had, uh, I think it was last week, Friday. Um, Roger Victory had an outing at the golf course. He invited me to come along. So we rode around for a while. It was pretty interesting. And we talked to a lot of legislators. And it, that, that four-year term for, for commissioners is just totally off the table as far as they're concerned. They got so much stuff going on. That's the last thing on their mind. So, All right. so I'd throw right. it out there and let you know. Motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thanks for attending, Greg. You bet. Thanks for having me. Take care of yourself, okay? You bet. Thank you. All right.